Let's study 9th standard ICAC, Biology Chapter 5, Pollination and Fertilization. Pollination is the process of transference of the pollen grains from the anther to the stigma. That is the first step for sexual reproduction in plants because only after pollination can fertilization happen. Now pollination can be self-pollination or cross-pollination. Self-pollination means the pollen grains from a flower fall on the stigma of the same flower or another flower of the same plant. So in self-pollination, even though it's sexual reproduction, actually the parent is only one. Because even if the pollen grain falls on another flower, since it is on the same plant, the DNA of the male gamete and the female gamete is the same. So hardly any varieties will be produced in the progeny, that is the offsprings. On the other hand, if the pollen grain from a flower falls on the stigma of another flower of another plant, but of the same species of course, then that is called cross-pollination. And another name for cross-pollination is allogamy. Self-pollination, as I, as I discussed, it's of two types, autogamy, that is in the same flower, which is very rare, or getinogamy, which is on another flower, but of the same plant. If pollination happens between two different species, then the further processes won't happen. No fertilization can take place. The pollen grains would simply wither away because the species are different. Now, usually in nature, we see that cross-pollination is the norm. Self-pollination is rare. For example, in some pansy flowers, which are growing close to the ground level, they do not open at all. So self-pollination is the only option. And that too, autogamy. Such a condition, when the flowers don't open at all, is called clastogamy. Some other conditions have to be satisfied for self-pollination to happen. The plant has to be bisexual. That is, it should have both male and female plants. Uh, yes, unisexual flowers can also lead to self-pollination, but then the plant will have to be monoecious. That is, the same plant should have male and female flowers both. For example, pumpkin. We have studied this in the previous chapter. Some plants are dioecious, like palm and papaya. They have unisexual flowers, and the entire plant has only male flowers or female flowers. So self-pollination is not possible only cross-pollination is possible. There are other mechanisms through which nature prefers cross-pollination. So let's study the five contrivances or five methods in which cross-pollination is favored in nature. First, unisexuality. As I just mentioned, if the flowers are unisexual, then cross-pollination becomes more probable. Although self-pollination is not ruled out in case the male and female flowers do exist on the same plant. Example, cucumber. The next method is dichogamy, which means different timings of maturation of androsium and gynaecium. If the stamens and the carpels mature at different times in the same flower, then self-pollination is not possible. Cross-pollination will be more suitable. In protandry, the anthers mature first, Example, sweet pea, salvia, sunflower. And in protogeny, the female parts of the flower mature first. That is a stigma. Example, custard apple and people. Next contrivance is self-sterility. So there are certain plants in which, in case if self-pollination happens, it leads to a process in which the further fertilization can't take place. This ensures that only if the pollen grain is from a different flower of another plant, but of the same species, can seed formation happen. Example of this is ray florets of sunflower, which are neuter flowers, also in orchids. The next contrivance is hercogamy. It's a mechanical or a structural barrier. In certain plants like pansy, some varieties of pansy may have a hood over their stigma and so self-pollination is not possible. That's called hercogamy. Next, heterostele. Here, the stigma and the anthers grow to different heights. You can see here that here the stigma is taller than the anthers. And here we can see that the stamens are taller 
than the carpels. Because of the difference in heights, self-pollination becomes very rare. Example of this is primrose and oxalis. So we see that nature favors cross-pollination. But why? The advantages of cross-pollination are that the offsprings are always healthier. Because if we have the DNA from two different parents combining together, the genetic variation leads to healthier offsprings. The seeds are ab abundant and viable, that is active. And of course, new varieties can be produced by cross-pollination and new varieties helps in survival of the species because it leads to evolution. Self-pollination do not give us these advantages. Self-pollination has these disadvantages that, that is the uh, offsprings are weak, uh, no new varieties are produced. And if there is any uh, defective characteristic in the parent, that will continue in the offsprings. That cannot be eliminated. Yes, cross-pollination has some disadvantages. First of all, the cross-pollination is not always certain because that has to depend on some agents like insect or wind, which may not be always available. And the cross-pollinating flowers have to produce abundant pollen grains, hoping that some of them will land on the stigma of a flower of another plant of the same species. So there is a lot of wastage of pollen grains because most of the pollen grains fall on the soil or the rocks or the stigma of another species, which is useless. So it is not ec economical for the flowers. A lot of resources, a lot of nutrition is used in making the flowers bright and attractive to make it fragrant and produce nectar to attract the insects for insect pollination. There is in self-pollination, there is no need to use a nutrient material in producing a lot of pollen grains or nectar or scent or large and colorful petals because in self-pollination, the pollen grain just has to fall on the stigma of the same flower or a neighboring flower of the same plant. So that's more economical. However, the fact that cross-pollination gives us healthier offsprings is enough for nature to prefer it. Now, based on the agent of cross-pollination, Flowers may be insect pollinated, which is called entomophilus. Now, if the flowers are pollinated by insects, then it will have certain characteristics. The flowers have to be large and brightly colored and should have scent and nectar so that the insects are attracted to it. Also, the pollen grains should be sticky and even the stigma so, so that the insects can easily pass on the pollen grains from one flower to another. Also, these flowers tend to be in clusters, making them very conspicuous and visible. For example, dahlia. Wind pollinated flowers, on the other hand, which are also known as anemophilous flowers. Example, lotus. Yes, lotus is a wind. <clears throat> I'm sorry. Um, wind pollinated example is maize. Lotus is an example of insect pollinated. It's not water pollinated. Lotus is insect pollinated. Wind pollinated is uh, the flowers. Example, maize. Their flowers are small. They're not brightly colored. They don't produce scent or nectar because they don't have to attract insects. However, the stamens have to be long and they should hang out of the flower so that it is exposed to air and the wind can easily carry the pollen grains away. The anthers are also loosely attached. The pollen grains have to be produced in very large quantities because there is no certainty that the pollen grain will fall on another flower. The pollen grains should be light, dry and smooth so that they can be easily carried away by the wind. The stigmas should be feathery and they should hang out so that they can easily trap the pollen grains. Now, if the pollination takes place with the help of water, then such pollination is called hydrophily and the flowers are called hydrophilus. The characteristics of such flowers are that the pollen grains are produced in large numbers and often the pollen grains have the same density as that of water so that they can float on the surface of water. Sometimes even the male flowers float on water. For example, in Vallis Naria, we can see that the male flowers are floating on water, searching for some female flower to crash against accidentally. And when the male flowers come in contact with these female flowers, which are also floating, but they are in contact with the plant, then the pollen grains may accidentally fall onto the female flowers and the cross-pollination can take place. There are many other methods of pollination. For example, birds may help in pollination, like in ornithophily. Elephants can help in pollination, which is called elephophily, which happens in a, the largest flower on earth, the Rafflesia flowers. They are so huge and uh, spongy. They are not crushed by elephants, rather elephants' feet help in the pollination of Rafflesia flowers. Artificial pollination is possible if we ourselves take the pollen grain from the anther and then sprinkle it on the stigma of another flower. So we are in control of the characteristics of the offsprings. So what, what we can do is, if we have a flower, we can remove the anthers from it. 
so that only the female part of the flower is left. This removal of anthers is called emasculation and this ensures that self-pollination is prohibited. Also, we can cover the female part or the entire flower with some plastic bag so that some random cross-pollination won't happen. We will choose which, which pollen grains from which flower has to be sprinkled on the stigma of the female parts. This way, we can ensure that the cross-pollination is artificially done and the offsprings will have the characteristics which we want. If we want a hybrid of two different flowers, we can go for this artificial pollination. After pollination, the next step is fertilization, which is nothing but the fusion of the male and female gametes, and it leads to the formation of the zygote. First, let's understand what happens to the pollen grains. If you magnify a pollen grain, which are very small, we see that it has two layers, the exine and the intine. Inside, we have two nuclei, the tube nucleus and the generative nucleus. When the pollen grain matures, and when it falls on the stigma, a pollen tube starts growing from this germ pore. And the tube nucleus directs the growth of the pollen tube inside the style of the carpel. Simultaneously, the generative nucleus splits into two sperm nuclei, also called male nuclei. So there are two male nuclei here. One is the groom and the other is perhaps his best friend. So as you can see, when the male nuclei arrive at the doorstep, a red carpet is laid out in their honor, while the female gamete is waiting for the fertilization. So certain chemical reactions happen in the style. The sugars of the stigma are used for the growth of the pollen tube. And they are directed towards the ovule. Here they have shown just one ovule, but the ovary can have multiple ovules as well. But let's focus on one ovule. Inside the ovule, there are seven cells. Three antipodal cells because they are on the opposite side of the egg cell. The egg cell is supported by two of her best friends called the cyanogens. And then we have the central cell. But the central cell has two polar nuclei. So totally, we have seven cells but eight nuclei in the ovule. They are all here for the wonderful occasion. The two male gametes walk along the ramp to reach the ovule and there is a gap through which they can enter in and that gap is called the micropyle. Now let's focus on what happens inside the ovule. So as I said, the ovule is inside the ovary of the carpel. The ovule has a nutritive tissue just inside it called the nucellus. And this nucellus is bound by two layers of integuments, the inner integument and the outer integument. And in between, we have food-laden cells. Now inside, as I said, that there were seven cells and eight nuclei. Once the male gametes enter through the micropyle, one of the male gametes fertilizes the egg cell, that is a female gamete, with the help of synergids, of course. And the other male gamete fertilizes the two polar nuclei. So this second male gamete is fertilizing with them. So here three nuclei are fertilizing together. That is called a triple fusion. And on this occasion, two fertilizations are taking place. One male gamete with the female gamete and the other male gamete with the polar nuclei. So since two fertilizations are taking place simultaneously, this entire process is called double fertilization. Because of this, first of all, the zygote is formed. And this triple fusion forms the endosperm. The endosperm will provide food for the future embryo. So after fertilization, let's understand the fate of the various parts of the flower. The petals and the sepals wither away, although sepals may remain because some fruits do have the green sepals. The ovary becomes the fruit after fertilization. The ovule becomes the seed and if many ovules have uh, been fertilized, then the fruit will have many seeds. Inside the ovule that has now become the seed, we have the embryo. The zygote which was formed by the fertilization will now divide to form the embryo, which is a baby plant. The synergids and the antipodal cells will all disappear, but the endosperm formed by this triple fusion will be there inside the seed. The integuments, which were the two layers, 
will form the seed coat called the testa and the tegmen. The wall of the ovary will become the fruit wall called the pericarp. And the point of attachment of this ovule to the ovary, which is called the placenta, that is the nutritive tissue, this becomes the stalk of the seed. So you can see here, inside this ovary, I see six ovules attached to the placenta. And this will become the stalk of the seed. So this will become the fruit, the ripened ovary. These will become the seeds. And inside the seed, we shall have the embryo. And when the seeds will germinate in the presence of soil, temperature, oxygen, once the fruit falls on the ground or the seed falls onto the ground, then the embryo inside the seeds will grow into a new plant. And we'll study more about it in chapter 6. Hi students, this is AJ sir. If you like this video, press the like button. If you would like to enroll for my online test series or online lectures, email me or message me on Instagram. Check the description for more information.